morning. Um, it is about 8.30 in the morning. I'm really, really looking forward to talking you through exactly how we approach this essay. I'm going to compare it with a sample model essay on exactly the same topic, and this should hopefully help you clarify exactly how we should approach this exact, uh, this exact question, which is the one you just did. So this one looks at the um, question, of course, of who was responsible for the Holocaust, and it has a very interesting interpretation of that responsibility. Um, unsurprisingly, probably of all the guests, by a quick reading of this, uh, this is written by an incredibly strong intentionalist historian. I figure I'd show you myself, hello, um, and I'm going to walk you through exactly how I approach this. So let's start with um, let's start with looking at the uh, excerpt itself, and we're going to take this bit by bit. So it says here at the top that no one knows when Hitler gave the order to annihilate the Jews. No written document has ever been discovered. Clues from various sources indicate that sometime in the spring of 41, Hitler gave a personal order to Himmler that Jews had to be eliminated. It is also highly likely that Hitler even suggested the precise nature of getting rid of the Jews, extermination by poison and gas. After all, he had made allusions to this since the early days of the party, and in Mein Kampf, he wrote that the German lives would have been saved in World War I. If the these Hebrew corruptors of the people have been subject to poison gas. So she couches um, the uh, interpretation in what is, I guess, widely accepted in terms of when the final order came down. But really, the focus of this first paragraph is her notion that the um, allusion to when the Holocaust uh, began really started probably first at World War One, and that's basically where I begin. Now, if I go back to my uh, particular reading of this, I'm gonna ignore the bell for a sec, we see that I say in the first paragraph, can I learn from sor the source that the author is an intentionalist? The historian addresses the question of the origin of the Holocaust and traces it to the early writings of Hitler in the 1924 book Mein Kampf. The intentionalist approach, and here I am explaining, places uh, the responsibility for the Holocaust with Adolf Hitler and his immediate subordinates. They point out that the Holocaust was envisaged by Hitler long before the war began and was an ultimate goal. This goal, according to the intentionalist, is hit, uh, was something that Hitler never wavered from. Okay, now I, I go on in the second paragraph after explaining briefly where this person sits to talk about the extract itself. Here we see, oops, um, forget that. Here we see um, the first direct quote from the source. Okay, the extract goes on to say that Hitler had indicated that he'll destroy the Jews of Europe from as far back as World War One when he quotes from Mein Kampf that quote, "If these Hebrew corruptors of the people had been subject to poison gas, they would have won the war." This, of course, is a very, very strong intentionalist viewpoint, that taking the view that the uh, decision for the Holocaust, I suppose, wasn't an ad hoc responsibility, um, or ad hoc re reaction, rather, to what was going on at the time. It was something that Hitler had envisioned, had alluded to from long ago, okay? And this actually takes the idea of the responsibility or the planning of the Holocaust even further back to the First World War. And I say here that it, extreme, it, it indicates a pretty extreme intentionalist viewpoint. I guess we can conclude that this is a strong intentionalist viewpoint. And what comes next, of course, is when you identify that, you pull that right from the first picture, our first bit of the source here, you have to put exactly where the historians uh would agree. Now, if you're reading a book that's, say, by Ian Kershaw, he's probably not going to go to Mein Kampf and say, yeah, this is viable evidence for the um, destruction of the Jews, whereas this author seems to indicate that it actually is. So I, I bring that up here, and I say this indicates, again, the extreme intentionalist viewpoint. He was, few historians draw the conclusions that Hitler had in his mind from the outset um, of, or the end of World War I, the notion of the extermination of the Druze. This is at strong odds with a more widely accepted viewpoint that the decision to exterminate the Jews was made either of necessity due to the changing fortunes of the German offensive or Russia. You get, you get the idea. What you could put there, and actually it's something in hindsight, what we could add in this particular point is we could add, okay, this, um, though the historian addresses the decision being made in 1941, uh, the historian alludes to the fact that this uh, was long planned, okay? Which is actually something that um, most other historians don't. 
Um, moving on to the second bit, I, I, as you can see, I take this bit by bit. And the second bit actually looks at what is actually, well, what is something that's not used or not looked at by a lot of historians, um, or at least not credited by historians who have looked at it. It's the fact that, um, as will be recalled, Hitler had publicly warned the Jews. So she goes back to the Hitler speech of the 30th of January, 1935, basically the one where he says in the sports class, that uh, in Berlin, that if the Jews bring on this war, it will lead to the annihilation of the entire uh, Jewish community. He goes on to talk with a little talked about piece of information, an article by um, uh, the head of the World Zionist Movement in a letter to Prime Minister Chamberlain, which was published in the Jewish Chronicle, which declares that the Jews would be fighting on the side of Britain and the democracies. She goes on to interpret that that evidence um, is effectively meaning that um, this triggered Hitler's rationale for exterminating the Jews or looking at them as, as the enemies of the state. So this pushes the timeline of the Holocaust quite a bit further. Um, she basically goes on to say that Weizmann was National Socialist's enemy number one. She also said that Hitler makes a bunch of other remarks about the Jews and never reveals what's actually being done to them. When he made this reference to Weizmann, Hitler is still maintaining the illusion that the Jews were being imported eastward. And I think the key here is this sentence where it says maintaining the illusion. And look how I treat that in the following paragraph. Now, um, furthermore, the historian's use of the Hitler speech of 30th January 1939 is equally contested. Um, the author points to the fact that 30th January 1939, he warned them in case of war that the Jews would be annihilated. He points to evidence that Chaim Weizmann, head of the World Zionist Movement, had apparently pledged Jewish support to the Allies, yada yada. Um, and then sort of re recapping what the author what the author says, okay? And here is my, my sort of recap of what she means. This indicates that they see this as evidence that Hitler was at war with Jewry, and this was an example to indicate the extermination had already been decided at the outset of war. Um, this is another example of a strong intentionalist view of the evidence. Now, again, here is where I begin to contrast that and put that in the historical conversation, okay? Not only contrast that with evidence, contrast that with historians saying how they've approached evidence differently. And I say, however, this approach is widely controversial and not largely accepted. The author talks of the threat to Weizmann as being evidence that Hitler was only maintaining an illusion that the Jews were being deported eastward and, and or that he would pack them off to Madagascar, a direct quote from the source. Now, we know if we, we go back to um, lessons 9, 10, 11, and even when we look at uh, the No Hitler, No Holocaust lesson 14, you know that the uh, historians have, especially Byrne anyway, have looked at the, the notion of this order and concluded that they could have not logically made an order before the summer of 1941 to exterminate the Jews. Therefore, Madagascar was an illusion. He talks about the facts in, you know, that the extermination squads, those Einsatzgruppen, were only 33,000 men in number. Um, the men were trained in mass killing. This is hardly a uh, number required to carry out a long-term mass extermination. Um, I add more information here. I love, I'm a big fan of killing them with content, okay? Browning talks about the killings in the East being a quantum leap, but not necessarily a decision uh, by the summer of 1941, putting the decision to the September of 1941. And, and the fact that um, none of this evidence seemed to indicate there was an express, uh, that extermination was the express goal of the Fuhrer. I go on. Now, that's a key in here on that whole issue of the illusion in Madagascar. And I think this, this bit here is incredibly important for um, uh, what we say or, or how we approach this source, okay? The illusion that the Jews were being deported eastward, that he would pack them off to Madagascar. This is a really interesting approach to this. Now, most historians also consider the aforementioned Madagascar plan, okay, which the historian dismisses as an illusion, as a serious consideration. Few historians think or uh, that Hitler envisaged and planned the final solution for 1933. Um, we can actually see that most historians agree that anti-Semitism played a role in the evolution of Jewish policy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but his, uh, um, the, the sort of the notion of the Madagascar plan here was actually real and something that the, um, the Nazi hierarchy uh, took into consideration. In fact, most historians believe that when Heydrich in 1940 here, um, 
told the Foreign Office to look into the Madagascar plan. It was actually an intention of the Nazi leadership and the Fuhrer, because if you consider it, most historians look at both Himmler and Heydrich, and these guys are unflinchingly loyal. They don't do anything against the Fuhrer's orders. So therefore, why would they be um, looking seriously into a plan for Madagascar when they have absolutely nothing to hide? Don't forget that by 1939, effectively all restrictions on the Fuhrer are lifted. He no longer really cares about international opinion because it is at war with the international world. So why would he be you know, trying to disguise a plan of sending them off to Madagascar. Certainly the German people don't necessarily care about Madagascar at this particular point of what's going to happen. It just doesn't seem to add up. Um, as it goes on here, um, uh, the, the historian seems to try and sort of back down from that, that that comment, not back down, but necessarily couch that comment in um, a sort of an interesting interpretation. She says that the concern for possible public reaction, combined with a mania for secrecy and perhaps some psychological need to keep this atrocity at a distance, kept Hitler from revealing the awful secret and his role to anyone but a few trusted henchmen, Himmler, Gold, Goebbels, Bormann, and Goering. And this is where a real intent, this is obviously an incredibly intentionless reading into this, that you know this was a, a direct plan and a secret, but it contradicts with what so much of the historians have said, okay? Um, I go on to say that um, that most historians uh, notice that there are serious gaps in the evidence and no order was ever found. The historian highlights the fact that she was worried about public opinion combined with the mania for secrecy and perhaps some psychological need to keep this atrocity at a distance. Um, here the historian tries to justify, as I say, the strong intentionalist stance by explaining away the fact that there was no order. Um, they blame it on Hitler's personality. There is in this essay, and here's again me contrasting what the historian says with the generally accepted opinion, uh, is uh, especially that put forward by the fu uh, functionalists, that um, uh, why would okay, any of his subordinates act contrary to the intentions when the entire of the history of the Third Reich is characterized by loyal and unflinching obedience to the fear? For instance, here, interestingly enough, why does Browning indicate that there was no master ghettoization plan? So, in other words, what I'm trying to get at here is if the Holocaust was planned all along, certainly they would have had a more thought out ghettoization plan rather than the ad hoc uh, plan that developed as a condition of their takeover of Poland in 1939. Um, some historians even claim, and this is an important co counter to that, that if Himmler and this small group of subordinates knew how come they didn't act like they know? Historians claim that effectively, um, if you want to know what Hitler is thinking, watch what Himmler is doing. Um, so this sort of contradicts uh, exactly what the historian says and sort of puts them in this sort of very unique space of looking at this as a, a long-term plan of the Fuhrer. Now, as I move towards the end of this analysis, I come back to the uh, I come back to this particular point right here. Oops, there's my submit. Ah, I come back to this particular paragraph, and it looks at this the, the statements by Hitler and his co-subordinates in the spring of '41. Okay, and they can trace the planning of the final solution with reasonable accuracy. Nobody's going to argue that. Okay, however, they throw, or she throws in this case. Um, I should mention this is Lucy Davidowitz. This is the strong intentionalist. I'm just saying that because I know who it is. Uh, you would have to refer to it as the historian. Um, don't get into the game of trying to prove who the historian is. It's relatively irrelevant. But the historian in this case talks about this order here uh, on the 3rd of March in a meeting with on the 2nd of April with Alfred Rosenberg, where he writes down in his diary something very vague to the effect of what do I not, what I do not write down today, I will nonetheless never forget. And all of the evidence and the approach to this evidence seems to indicate that the author is reading into this that um, Hitler had, had given the command and that he was just going on about, um, uh, uh, well, rather he was furthering his wishes much further or much further ahead of the time, which of course we know is strongly contested by the functionalist historian. So let's go back to the, the analysis. Um, here is where I talk about the, the statements by Hitler about the planning of the final solution. Um, the, the, here, the historian cites directives on the war in Russia in which the Jewish intelligentsia must be eliminated and talks of the conversation with Alfred Rosenberg, Riesstun, and then this is me quoting, the author concludes that this evidence 
is um, for Hitler's planning of the final solution and is characteristic of the intentionalist approach. He then cites evidence of a call between Him Himmler and Haas, which seems to verify the order. Why don't we say instead of he, the historian, um, which seems to verify the order. Now, I counter that in the next paragraph. I go, it's pretty interesting that he approaches the evidence in this way. There are, as Ian Kershaw points out, serious gaps in the evidence, and most historians do not agree with interpreting the evidence and, having, and have suggested since that there's a lack of concrete evidence linking an order to the Fuhrer and date for this order. Anyways, um, and you have to approach this question in a different way. So instead of reading into what little evidence we have, you have to look at, and this is where the functionalists come in, concrete evidence of what exactly people are doing. So without the, in the absence of an order, we can't read into these sort of diary entries. We can't read into these vague conversations that we do have records of. The only concrete way and the only real way to approach it is generally the way that most functionalists or people who are at least moderately intentionalist have and looked at what people are doing, which is something that this historian isn't doing. They're making giant quantum leaps, if you will, from relatively vague evidence, <clears throat> okay? And what people are doing, if we want to borrow what Kershaw looked at, points to the fact that there little happens <clears throat> between that Rosenberg meeting in April 41 and September, October 1941, when the actual people who become responsible for the Holocaust act like they know what they're doing. So most historians find it unreasonable to conclude that before September, October 1941, that there was a clear decision in the Fuhrer, because as Afor mentioned, Nobody does anything, especially as serious as the Holocaust, without the Fuhrer's prior, uh, prior approval. So in showing the strong intentionalist approach to the topic, I, this is really my conclusion where I wrap it all up. <clears throat> um, this extract was most likely <clears throat> written by a historian in the first few decades after the Holocaust. So I'm trying to couch it. We know that Holocaust historiography sort of ebbs and flows. It goes from the strong intentionalist to the extreme functionalist, and then sort of back to the middle where we are today. So it's likely, though not necessarily the case, that this person probably wrote this in the first few decades after the Holocaust. This was most when most of the historians accepted the intentionalist interpretation. As we know, this began to change with Momsen and Brozat in uh, the 70s and 80s, but most of the historians who did write this were German, though not exclusively so, and tried to come to grips with how their people could have done what they did. The most easy solution offered, of course, was that they were just following Hitler's long-standing direct orders, that it wasn't as Goldhagen, for instance, had claimed the, uh, uh, the long-standing uh, German particular trait of anti-Semitism. And actually, um, uh, we can add that here to strengthen this. Yeah. Claims, claims that there, the Holocaust was primarily due to the fact that Germans held Genocidal anti Okay. Um, so, anyways, uh, well, let's spell. As we have learned that. I don't know how to spell genocidal. That's embarrassing, whatever. Um, anyways, moving on, uh, ignoring the fact that nobody's a perfect speller, let alone me. Mm. We find that, um, I swear genocidal is a word, and I swear it's spelled like that. Anyways, that's a question for, uh, that's a question for the dictionary in another day. But anyways, moving on. Um, the, um, I sort of couched this, okay? Um, these, I go on to say that these historians are likely to uh, ignore the personal and situational factors at play that may have forced Hitler's hand, um, may have forced Hitler's hand or gave him the opportunity to intensify anti-Jewish policy towards extermination, yada, 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 the counter. So again, finally, I, I go, though in recent years, some aspects of the intentionalist approach have been more accepted. Most historians conclude that the responsibility for the Holocaust lies with Hitler. Um, uh, 
historian Morris says, no Hitler, no Holocaust, but contrary to the degree of responsibility this historian places on Hitler, and here I'm saying that, but this historian's way on the far side. Most historians conclude that though Hitler was the ideological driving factor, a host of situational, personal, and institutional factors places pressure from below on Hitler. That's the Brown and Goldhagen aspect. Not only that, Kershaw allowing him to take more extreme measures as they were happening. Therefore, since there's no recognition of this and many other things in the interpretation that, um, uh, uh, and many other things in the interpretation of the historian is more likely a strong intentionalist. And here's my conclusion. This was probably written before 1980, which, yes, it was. Um, you get the sort of idea. Break going through the source bit by bit, talking about what the historian says, talking about where that is. It's what the historian says. How far is this agreed? What the historian says, how far is that agreed? What the historian approach the evidence was in this respect? Um, is that approach controversial? Is that approach widely accepted? You go down chunk by chunk. I don't write this in sections. I literally follow the extract all the way through, giving a thorough and detailed analysis of each point the historian is making, each uh, approach towards uh, a particular topic the historian is taking, and then bring bringing to the front detailed evidence to support or refute that um, that interpretation. Now, in the end, it's enormously important that here, as we see, we have a thorough conclusion, okay, about what we learned. In fact, if you want to be really, really specific, okay, in conclusion, I can learn, I can learn that by showing a strong intentionalist approach to the topic, okay, um, you can be exactly more direct in answering the question, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Though here, I, I'm not 100% sure they would have taken it away had I not been so overt. But, you know, better be safe than sorry. You can add that. Now, my conclusion is thorough. Okay, I look at the approach um, versus the uh, intentionalist versus the functionalist. I try to place it where it is. And then, of course, you always end with a very strong closing sentence where you say what this exact historian was. So I'm going to give you guys this as an example to go against what you guys have written, but the sort of hopefully what you can see here is that, you know, there is a methodology but, uh, of approaching this, but you have to go bit by bit through the source. Um, hey, it's me. Um, and if you go bit by bit through the source, you should be able to come to um, a, a relatively good conclusion if you know your stuff. So have your notes ready. Make sure you know this stuff. Make sure you know where you're going to put these, uh, put this historian. And this shouldn't really be that hard of a paper. Um, the level of content knowledge I put in this paper is probably more than you need to even access the top levels of the Mark scheme. Nevertheless, um, I'm always in favor of students overwhelming the examiner with their own knowledge. It makes it harder for the examiner to take uh, points away from you. So know your stuff. Um, and good luck. We'll do another one of these for the next paper that we go through. So uh, you guys can go back and see exactly how uh, and why you may have gone wrong.